All right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to week four of the Leadership Alliance Professional Development Workshop Series. My name is Dr. Thais Bingham Hickman, and I'm the Associate Director of the Leadership Alliance, and I will be moderating today's event. This event is a component of the Leadership Alliance's Virtual Professional Development Series. The Leadership Alliance Executive Office and its partners created this initiative to ensure continuity of skill building, networking, and exposure to graduate programs from students for students from all across the country. Paired with our Wednesday evening workshop series, we hope to expose you to a discussion of critical issues, allow you to network with one another, and develop learning approaches and skills for navigating your research career. This evening, I'm pleased to introduce our resident doctoral scholar, Dr. Labib Ruana. Labib Ruana is a Mexican-born biologist who was raised in Chichua, Mexico, in El Paso, Texas, in a bicultural home. His father is Lebanese and his mother is Mexican. He received a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Texas at El Paso and a doctoral degree in genetics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Ruan is a member of the Leadership Alliance um, and has been since his participation in a research program for undergraduates at Hunter College in the summer of 2000. After completing his PhD, he did postdoctoral training in the laboratories of Kyoto University and Philip Newmark. Currently, Dr. Ruana is an associate professor of biological sciences at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, where his laboratory focuses on identification of genes that regulate stem cells, regeneration, and the development of gametes. Next year, he will start a new position as an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. His work and training have been funded by the National Institutes for Health, the National Science Foundation, and the Ford Foundation. So welcome, Dr. Ruana, and um, thank you all for joining. Uh, we will start with uh, Dr. Ruana giving us an overview of his journey, and then we can jump into student questions. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Ingham Hickman. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to talk to the students that are in the position that I was some uh, 20 years ago. So it seems like not that long ago, but, but uh, it has been 20 years and, and time flies by when you're you know, doing what you like. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was, I was born in, in Chihuahua, uh, Mexico, and uh, I lived there until I was uh, you know, I think about something like 13, uh, my family decided to move to, to El Paso, which is right across the border. So given the high density of, of Mexican and Mexican-American families there, uh, there wasn't much of a culture shock, you know? Uh, you know, I went there to a public middle school, public high school. And when I graduated, I applied to the only college that I knew you know, that came to mind, which was the one in town, University of Texas El Paso. You know, not, not growing up in the US, I was never familiar with all the process behind going to college and how people start applying in their junior year and, and how people, you know, try to get scholarships and, 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 and start thinking about it, about this in high school. I, I just, I think I applied to go to college the summer before the fall semester started, like two weeks in, two weeks into the semester, you know, before the semester started. And uh, at the time, my my family was was uh, being supported by my mom only. My parents had gotten divorced, and uh, you know, we I qualified for financial aid. So so I was I had a full time job, but given the the Price of tuition back then, which which I think was like one or two thousand dollars a semester, which is much different from what it is now, and living at home, you know, I was able to get out of college without debt, which was great, and uh, and then I was lucky enough to to find a, an opportunity to to go to graduate school to a PhD program at the University of Wisconsin, and I didn't even know where Wisconsin was when they accepted me. I I looked at a map, and the funny thing was that the professor who I was working with at the time, he, he was from Texas, 
he had been in Texas throughout his life and he didn't know where Wisconsin was either. So, so uh, you know, I guess I wasn't that embarrassed when, when, when I, I didn't know where he was, but when I saw where he was, I knew I was gonna have a hard time dealing with the cold, you know? Uh, which at the end was, wasn't so bad. I actually had a lot of fun in Wisconsin. I found a great group of, of mentors and, and, and colleagues there, other students. Uh, one even from Texas that you know went through all that with me. Uh, most importantly, you know, I we had the opportunity here in the U.S. that there are many many ways to get a PhD without having to pay. You know, you TA, you do your research, and then uh, you know you you get a PhD without having to get a loan. So so that is that is the main reason why I was able I was able to get a, a PhD because money wasn't a, an issue. You even get a stipend, right? Uh, and course. how did you adjust to that? So you mentioned, um, you know, you were exposed to many cultures, you know, growing up in El Paso. Um, and what I think this leads into one of our student questions. How, you know, how has your background shaped your career? And do you feel like, you know, going to the University of, of Wisconsin, do you feel as though uh, your experience has created either pathways or, you know, ha has it opened up your eyes to the fact that we need more diversity, specifically of Latinx and Middle Eastern um, communities in either your profession or in academia. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so so growing up, right, I, I'm already kind of an outsider. Uh, I got a Middle Eastern name, right? My my. My friends in school in, in Mexico used to make fun of my name, you know, because it was so strange. I always had to, you know, spell my name out and, and, and all of that. Uh, the difference is when I was in Mexico, though, I, I didn't feel like an outsider. I feel like, a, you know, maybe it's not so well known, but Mexico is also a country of immigrants and it's, and it's quite diverse. And the reason that, you know, so much of the, I guess the, the racist weight on, on, on young people growing up, you know, is, is not as, uh, as heavy as here. There is some sort of uh, inequity socially, big social inequities, and also differences on the way, uh, you know, television or people portray white skinned people versus mestizos, you know, versus people of more uh, indigenous background, but uh, I was an outsider, you know? So, so coming to El Paso, coming to the United States, I was still an outsider. Uh, and then in Wisconsin, you know, people couldn't guess where I was from, you know? So, so I, I, I get the advantage that being some, I mean, it's, it's sad to say, but, but is the reality being somewhat light skinned, right? Uh, maybe people didn't treat me uh, too badly, but I did. I do have, you know, once I start talking, people notice my accent, and then, you know, once people know I'm from Mexico, sometimes you you get some some uh, comments that are not so so great. But but the point is, being that I came from a diverse family, I was already a little bit ready to 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 come in from a an outsider, you know, knowing that I'm an outsider and knowing how to navigate, kind of uh, being an outsider, trying to be friendly to everybody. You know, trying to, uh, you know, trying to appreciate what they like and try to be open to, to new experiences, and also try not to take things too personally. Uh, try to like, you know, let some things just brush brush off your shoulder, you know, and 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 try to keep your mind focused on what you what you want, why you why I was going to to graduate school. Uh, yeah, and can you can you expand upon that a little bit? Um, we have a question about someone who has recently moved for the first time, um, and they'd like to know if you have any advice for anyone who is moving to a new place and getting over culture shock, making friends out kind of outside of your lab. So, do you have any um, insight or tips for anyone who is going through that transition? Yeah, I mean, so. For me, starting graduate school, you know, you start with the people that are in your class and you kind of get to know them and you get to know which ones you click with and which ones you, you don't want to be around so much. Uh, 
I was lucky that there was another student, like I said, who was uh, Miguel Dominguez. He was from, uh, I think, uh, Corpus Christi or, or, or Houston. He was from Houston. Uh, so we, you know, we, we, we support each other throughout. So, so that was great. So, you know, that speaks to not being the only one in the, in the room who's from a certain background, but actually having others that you can connect to. But both me and him will hang out with many of, of the other students who might not have the same background, but like to do some, some of the same things, like play soccer. Uh, we will get together to play poker sometimes. Uh, so just finding maybe a once a week hobby to do outside of the lab will connect you to some people, you know, and they might be in grad school or not. Uh, and just kind of, it's the one day a week that you have something else to do and you get to meet some other people. And you know, if you feel like an out, like you have nobody the first year, every year there are new people coming, right? So you can, you can, uh, you know, build up your relationships year after year. And can you talk a little bit about your international experience? So someone asked about, um, you know, Kyoto and how long were you there? Will you go back? And just, you know, in general, what was it like uh, doing an international or having an international experience? Right. So, so, so going to Japan, I gotta say, you know, first of, first of all, it was, it was awesome. It was great. And I, uh, I was able to go when, when I interviewed, you know, I didn't have funding to go there yet, but, uh, Japanese scientists really like to have people come from the U.S. Uh, because, you know, it, it uh, well, what they told me was that it gives them the experience, the, the opportunity to experience, uh, to practice, you know, just conversation uh, in English, you know, kind of forces that. And also, uh, you know, cultural exchange. They love, you know, learning about other cultures and also showing the richness of, of their culture. So, so that my, my PI, my, my, my boss there told me, you know, you can come here, I got funding for you. Now, a few months later, when I was actually ready to go, uh, the funding wasn't there anymore, but I was fortunate enough that I, I got funding from the NSF. So I was able to go and in a way, you know, pay for myself and, and have that security. Now I wanted to go just for a year because I wanted to make sure uh, that I did a postdoc in the US too. So that when I went into the, the job market, when I was looking for a job, uh, my mentor would be somebody who was familiar with the process of looking for a job in the US, looking for a job in academia, which is what I wanted to do in Japan is, 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 is it has many differences from, from the US. Uh, everything from how you write a letter, how a mentor would write a letter for you, to you know how many applications you put out there, because there are more opportunities here and different types of opportunities than there. Now being there, uh, it was great. I mean, the group, you know, was a little bit different from from here. We had like tiers of people, and and you know the the grad, graduate students taught the undergrads and the the graduate students were taught by the postdocs and even when we went out we divided the bill according to how much you know you make and and we really tried to it's more like a team effort all throughout uh than the kind of individualistic experience that i had i was familiar with here uh would i go back yes uh it's hard now that i have a family right we got to think about children and schools and uh spouse jobs things like that but back then i was a single man uh you know with nothing but what i could carry in my in my suitcase so i was it was easy to go and come back <laughs> and what made you want to become um or go into academia as opposed to other career options um what made you want to become a professor well i i guess for me it was you know being an undergraduate and a little bit kind of lost, you know, I jumped around majors a lot. I didn't know exactly what to do. Uh, then I got interested in genetics, right? It was the time during the, when the human genome was being sequenced. And I, I listened uh, in a molecular biology class, I heard about an example of a 
Bolivar, a plasmid named after after uh, Bolivar and Rodriguez, which were a Mexican American and a Mexican scientist who were uh, working in Caltech, I believe. And uh, when I heard that name, I'm like, wow, man, they're already like Mexicans and Mexican Americans providing tools uh, for doing genetic research. So, so I can do this. So I applied for the summer program at, uh, at City University of New York, the, the Leadership Alliance. Uh, this is my connection. And there, you know, I had a mentor, Dr. Rika Runner, who was my first, like, you know, close scientific mentor. And she taught me things, you know, how to, you know, things that I didn't think about that you don't learn in class. So through that experience, you know, I felt like it helped me so much that I, I said, you know, I want to do the same for others. I want to, you know, I love science, but I also love trying to help the next generation. And, 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 and you know, that's kind of like when you go into academia, you're not doing it for the money. You're doing it because you love teaching. So, so and you'll do the law and research. And I, and I found opportunity to balance both of those things. Yes, and can you elaborate on, I think we, ha we have a quite a few questions come up on this um, in terms of your graduate and postdoc experience in terms of moving, um, moving sites and changing directions. Um, so can you elaborate on either how easy or difficult it is when you're moving from research site to research site or academic institution to another academic institution? Um, and how do you kind of plan for those opportunities? Yeah, so, uh, so as a graduate student, uh, I was in a laboratory uh, with Professor Marv, Rick, Marv Wickens. Marvin Wickens, he was really you know, a great mentor. Uh, and we used to do different techniques in the lab, right? And, and some graduate students, were specialists in one technique and others were specialists in another technique. And one day I asked him, you know, you know, I, I wanna, you know, when you're a graduate, you really wanna get, you wanna publish a paper. That's like, I wanna publish a paper and you can't wait to publish a paper. So I thought, hey, if this other student helps me do this experiment, because he does that experiment every day, I can have that figure and I can get the paper a lot faster. And he told me, no, you do it yourself. And, and you know, I thought it was kind of like a, it didn't make too much sense. But in reality, he was more focused about me training and trying to learn, you know, learning how to do as many things as I could on my own. So when I moved somewhere else, you know, I had a better, you know, arsenal, a better, a better toolbox, more things that I could do. So with that preparation of being able to do different things on my own, because I had time to figure that out in grad school, I was able to look for a postdoc and say, look, I'm interested in this field, which is different from mine, but I can use all these tools that I learned as a graduate student, which I don't see are being utilized too much in this field. And together, you know, uh, to start doing these experiments to answer these questions. And in this way, you become attractive to them because you're bringing some knowledge in that they don't have in there already. And also, you're becoming a specialist so that when you go apply for funding or when you go look for a job, I could say, you know, you know, I'm the one that's doing this. I've been able to advance this. And really, you know, there is a lot, so much that is not known because people haven't worked on it. So when making moves, I always try back then to learn something. You know, where am I going to go there to learn? And uh, how can I convince them? to host me there, because it's also work for them to host somebody, right? They are, they are also training me. How can I convince them that I'm a good investment all the time? And it is because I work hard and because I have shown that I'm successful at doing certain things. We have a question about your most recent um, transition that came into the Q&A. So uh, the question is, what experience made you consider moving to your next job? Um, as professor at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a heavy question. That that's a very complex question. So so there are many things, right? Uh, there are many things. One thing I can tell you, one thing that shocked me that I wasn't aware of when I was a a student 
even a grad student, or maybe even a, even a postdoc, is uh, how much of, of, of how much universities have become like a business, you know, very heavily like a business, you know. So uh, I thought education was was especially public education. All my education has been in public institutions, and I always thought the main focus was the you know betterment of society preparing our future uh our future scientists our future teachers our future whatever field and when you start working at a, at a university you begin to see uh that sometimes people's priorities or what you expect the people running the university they, they, they might not have they might have other priorities right so here at Rice State, right now the priority has been to, to cut expenses so that we can uh, be in a better financial uh, place moving forward. Because we had financial issues in the past. You know, the faculty were, ever, were even in a 20 day strike uh, two, days, uh, two years ago, sorry. Uh, so right now, the administration decided to cut faculty by 20%. So out of 500 and some faculty, they're gonna fire uh, 113 have to go somehow. So before they decide, before they start, before people get fired, they give faculty that are here a chance to uh, retire early with some bonus to retire early or just live on their own uh, if they're able to find other jobs and, and, you know, when this situation came about and I, there were other things happening, I wasn't too happy here anymore. I said, well, let's take a new challenge. And UMass Boston is, a, you know, is a, I think the number one uh, uh, most, you know, diversified student body in New England uh, region. It's a public university. I have colleagues there that, you know, I can, have the same research, some of the same research, research interests, and some of the same uh, goals of you know empowering future generations of uh, underrepresented student, students. And I said, you know, they, I'm going to apply, and if, if 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 I get an opportunity, I'm I'm willing to to sacrifice some things to to take that challenge and hopefully be happier there. So that's that's what I'm doing. Yeah, and I think that's important for, for students to understand is, you know, you, you, sometimes you have a plan and it works out, but the, there are other times that either challenges or opportunities arise where you kind of have to adjust your path or your journey and it takes you to even, you know, a better place um, than where you were. So I think that's important uh, for students to understand that and for you to share that. That's great. Yeah. and. and and you know there is risk. Things might not work out for me. You know, if, you know, I, I'm giving up tenure here. I might not get tenure there. Although I, I you know, I, I don't go in there with thinking that I'm not going to get it. I think that I will, or there is a possibility that it doesn't. But that's okay. You know, I still have my degrees. I have my papers. I have my experience, and uh, I can look for other jobs if if things don't work out for me. Yeah. So speaking of your journey and. Uh your pathway here, uh, we have a question about if you could go back in time, you know, hindsight is 2020 and redo anything about your journey um, in terms of where you are today, what would you change and why? And can you give some advice to your former self, your undergraduate self? Uh, what, would, what would you say? You know, I mean, I I, I mean, professionally speaking, you know, my trajectory, I wouldn't change it. I, you know, I, I could, I have kids now, right? So if, 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 uh, when they're undergrads, I'm going to tell, you know, but because I'm an academic now, I had a PhD, you know, they're being exposed. They talk to faculty that come to, to lunch. They, they are going to know about research experiences. When, when they go to college or when they're in high school, they're probably gonna be working in a lab if, if they're interested in science. So I guess in, in, I cannot say that I would change anything of what I did because 
kind of that trajectory made me who I am. And I'm happy with, with what I achieve. But if I wanted to put myself in a better position, which I guess is what I might do for my kids, maybe it's a mistake to make it easier for them. You know, I would say, hey, you should start looking for a research experience since you're in high school. You should try to, you know, join the science fair and, and you know, you know, all these things that, that students are really aware of nowadays, you know, uh, and really it speaks to that disadvantage of students that our future generation uh, have, because they don't have that advice from home. Uh, but at the same time, maybe because they, they're not, it's, it's a little bit harder for them, they, you know, they find ways of making it on their own and that prepares them better for the future. So. So I, I don't know, that's, that's, that's a convoluted answer, but really I wouldn't change anything, yeah. And we had quite a few questions about your, your research um, interests. So what originally got you interested in biology, specific, specifically in genetics? Um, and was graduate school hard for you in general, assuming that you were doing multiple kind of that you're working in multiple different fields um, and had m multiple funding sources. Yeah, so, so, okay. So what got me interested in genetics? Well, first, what got me interested into taking biology classes was, uh, I actually had a chance to go live uh, six months in Lebanon with and meet my family there. And I had a, a cousin that I spent a lot of time with who was a medical student. And the guy would always be studying. You know, I, I was pretty studious uh, when I was a student throughout high school and, and, and college. But this guy was really insane. Like every waking hour, he'll be, he'll be studying. And that kind of inspired me a little bit. I said, man, maybe I should try to be a little bit like him. Uh, maybe I'll try to go pre-med. And that didn't last long, you know, after, after one, one semester, uh, I, just, I, I realized I didn't want to be pre-med. I like uh, figuring things out more than, than uh, kind of memorizing things. And, and, and fortunately, at the same time, like I said, the human genome was being sequenced and I started learning about molecular biology and I wanted to know how cells things, how cells did different things based on the same genome. Why a neuron can be a neuron compared to a skin cell when they have the same genome how these 20,000 genes that are protein coding genes in, in the genome get turned on and off. And uh, yeah, that kind of got me going in that direction. Uh, in graduate school, I spent the first two years on a project that didn't go anywhere. So I wasn't always successful. And in graduate school, I applied for funding and I never got funding, you know, because I didn't have that, that uh, CV that other students had who had done more undergraduate research who had a paper as an undergraduate, you know? So I had to play catch up. And uh, another project came on my, on my third year and it was kind of starting from, from scratch a little bit, but that project went really well. And then uh, I got a paper and uh, thought I had enough to graduate. And my PhD advisor told me, you know, you'll be in better shape if you have two papers. So even though you could graduate on your fifth year, because you know, as a student, you're always in a hurry to graduate and start making some real money, you know, with your PhD, or just get it getting it done, right? He said, no, if you get two papers, then you'll you you'll separate yourself from, from the average or from the rest when you apply for postdocs, apply for postdoctoral funding, or try to find a job. So I listened to him. You know, back then he might, I might have thought. Yeah, right, you just want to get more work out of me. But really, when I listened to him, he was exactly right. And now that I sit on panels, you know, I see how people, students, graduate students with more papers, uh, not like, you know, it doesn't mean that the more you get, the better. But at least, you know, you have more than one and it's mostly your work. And it's a, it's, it looks like, you know, it's, it's a good paper. Uh, they do better and I did better. And, and that's how I started becoming successful, I guess. Yeah, that was actually one of our student questions. Um, the question is, do you think do you think that 
the students need to have a published paper before they apply to graduate school? No, not at all. I mean, I didn't, and I don't have, I, and, and, and here we accept students into, into our uh, PhD and master's program without papers, so you don't need one. If you have one, it puts you in a lot better position. But if you're doing research and opportunities come to present a poster, you know, mention that in your CV. You know, this is a, you know, it kind of, a, you know, it, it gives you evidence that you were able to not only get research experience, but actually get something that you presented to other people, right? So if you don't have a chance to get papers, yeah, getting papers is better. I'm not gonna lie there. Uh, first, any authorship as an undergraduate is great, but it's not expected that you come in with a paper from undergrad. Uh, do posters, do presentations, and list them on your CV. Thank you. Um... We have a few questions that came into the live chat, uh, the Q&A. So one of the questions is, um, have you ever felt that your academic work has been obstructed by racism or racist pre prejudice? If so, what advice would you give to other fellow Latinx um, who are striving for a future in academia? Yeah, I mean, you know, Underrepresented scientists have that burden that they always have to wonder whether things that happen to us happen to us because of our, you know, who we are. Uh, I mean, there has been there have been times what I know, or I feel like if I were just, you know, uh, you know, another white male born in the US, you know, that I may have been treated differently. Now did that, did that add a challenge? Yes. Did it kill my career or uh, would I have been doing a lot better if, if I were like that? I don't know. Uh, you just, you just roll with the punches and, and, and try to do the best that you can, you know, focus on getting your papers, applying for, for opportunities, you know. I mean, on the other hand, they have been opportunities like, you know, becoming a fourth fellow uh, that are not easy, you know, to get. You know, many people say, oh, yeah, well, you know, you got a fourth fellowship because you're Mexican American. Well, the truth is that I've been on those panels and there are like 150 minority students who are excellent competing for those fellowships. And also there are non-minority students that also compete for those fellowships. So the fact that you get one is not because you were a minority, it's because you were qualified and you were passionate about helping other minorities, you know, uh, in the future, that's the key. So, so, so yeah. I mean, there have been some 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 burdens, you know, at work. They've been jokes uh, that are offensive from students and other faculty that maybe they don't think, maybe they think they're funny. Uh, yeah, when there are conflicts, and you end up in the losing end, you wonder, you know, is it because? the bosses are not, don't feel as close to me as they are to other people. But at the same time, I've made a lot of good connections with people that embrace diversity that many of my white peers don't have those connections, you know? So, so they've been more gains, I think, at the end. Uh, I mean, I, I can talk to, every month I talk to a fourth fellow, a group of four fellows, uh, who are in liberal arts, you know, and I learned so much and they give me advice. And when I was looking for, the, for a job, they coach me. They coach me on negotiation. They coach me on, on a, you know, on how to plan for the future. And, and 
maybe I wouldn't have that if I if I if I wasn't, you know, if I didn't come from Mexico. And building upon that, I mean, we had a few questions from students about your experience in terms of adapting to um, adapting to your university outside of Texas and outside of kind of your cultural background. So how was that for you um, in terms of just being able to um, acclimate to a new environment? Yeah, I mean, I mean, in Wisconsin, you know, there, there were things that, that were different, right? I mean, I, I like Madison, it's a cool town, right? Uh, you go a little bit outside of Madison and then you really feel it. Right here in Dayton, uh, it's uh, we're right, right next to the Air Force Base. Uh, it's a very conservative town. You know, it, it's not very diversified. The, the, I mean, the city of Dayton is, but the, the places, the place where I live, Beaver Creek is not. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's tough. Maybe that added to the reason why I'm, I'm moving away. But really in graduate school and as a postdoc, uh, my main goal was always, you know, I, I enjoy doing science and I enjoy going to the lab and most of my time I spent it in the lab. Uh, so what was going on out there wasn't as important as me being happy in the lab. And as, as long as that was going on, I was able to, to thrive, you know? Uh, How do, how do I adapt? You know, they, yeah, they were, I mean, you, there, there are good things and good people everywhere. But really in, in science, for me, it was easy to adapt to all those places because wherever I went, most of my time I spent it in the lab and, and that's what made me happy. So, so I always found fun things to do with the little time that I, that I wasn't there. Uh, now for me, raising a family, Maybe I have things that now, uh, maybe I wanna be closer to my family, you know, but I can't have that. It's hard, it's hard to find jobs in academia in some places, right? If I wanna go back to El Paso, there is one university that could give me a job close to my family. Maybe two, if you come Las, Las Cruces, New Mexico. So, you know, you kind of, uh, you know, look for places that maybe you'll be happier. And, and, and that's fine, you know, you can, you can, when, you know, when you're pre-tenure, your focus really, it's on getting tenure. After that, you breathe a little bit and then you can decide, well, now that I got this job secure, where can I go next? If I'm interested, I can start looking for opportunities because you have a job. It's the best time to look for a job without pressure, right? And then, uh, you start looking for something that you might be happy with. So when you're a grad student, focus on your PhD. And after that, you know, kick butt in your PhD and then you can decide where to go to po for postdoc. You know, uh, that was always my, my mentality, looking a few years ahead. And do you have any advice for, um you know, in terms of imposter syndrome or building confidence in your academic work. Uh, we had some questions about that. So there's one student who's struggling um, because her academic institution is, is known for more being a, a, a party school as opposed to a serious academic institution. And she's wondering if, you know, if what she's doing is enough. So any insight or anything you wanna share about imposter syndrome yeah i mean i i still get i mean it's less now but i mean i, I was an assistant professor here at Wright state and i was getting imposter syndrome am i good enough you know i did all my schooling in uh public schools and uh, there were people here that were being hired at the same time as me in the same department that you know had worked in harvard or uh you know uh caltech something like that. And I went to a party school, the University of Wisconsin was, was known as a party school, but really it's the papers, you know, it's your science. You get your papers, you get a paper in a journal. That's not a party journal, you know, get, 
and, <laughs> and no matter where you come from, that's your paper, you know? If you get a fellowship, that's your fellowship. And, and nobody's gonna think about, it becomes less important where you are than, than what you put out there. And yes, it does help, I won't lie. Uh, if I'm a right state and I try to publish something, that's the same thing that somebody more senior from a more uh, renowned institution tries to publish. They're gonna have a probably an easier time getting it into a good journal. Mm -hmm. But you try the best that you can and uh, you do good work and you present it proudly, you know? And, and then, you know, you'll get opportunities. So, so yeah, if, if you feel like, oh, imposter syndrome, I don't belong here. Yes, I, I know the feeling. Work with your mentor or mentors, mentee, you know, on getting your work, getting it polished, you know, getting it, getting it progressing, trust them, because they know better than we know, right? My boss knew better than me when I was ready to publish papers. And then once you get it, the first one is the hardest one, the other ones come, and that's in your CV. And, and, and that, you know, the peer reviewers don't give you any breaks or uh, don't, don't care what race you are. I mean, well, there are some studies that show otherwise, but, you know, the science is the science, and that's the, the, the most important thing that's going to help you publish the papers. Uh, yeah, so I, mean, I, I would agree with that. I, for undergrad, I went to a small HBCU, uh, University of Maryland, East, Eastern Shore, and so when I started applying for graduate schools, I was like, you know, am I going to get into the, the school that I want to get into? Um, and it turned out, you know, by doing summer research experiences, by having that repertoire of research, and also the connections by doing the research experiences. So I did, you know, my one of my summer programs at the at New York University, and that's actually where I ended up going to graduate school because I made a, a good connection with the dean there. And that's not to say well, that's the reason that I got in. But I think exposing yourself to those opportunities in meeting people also opens up doors. Um, so it does, you know, I don't want to say it doesn't matter where you go to school, but I, I feel as though if you position yourself well and you do the things that you need to do um, to open up doors for yourself, then opportunities will present themselves. And, and actually, now that you mention it, now that there are our generation of people, right, more of us in, in, in uh, you know, in acceptance in, 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 in panels or in uh, committees, we make those arguments, right? We look at our applicants and say, well, this person went to Harvard and has two papers uh, from a huge lab that has, you know, and this other person, you know, they went to an HBCU and maybe they presented a poster but that's all their work. They had to, you know, they had to figure those things out on their own. They weren't working on their postdoc or anything. So I think they might be more successful being independent, you know. Uh, so now we're more aware of those of those challenges. So so when I started grad school, all my peers were from better schools, you mm -hmm. know, what I consider to be better schools. I'm like, I'm not gonna make it here. And at the end, you know, some didn't graduate, some didn't finish, some did. Uh, Everybody did okay because at the end, just making it to grad school is a big accomplishment. But uh, but I did okay, you know. Mm -hmm. I was underprepared. I won't lie. There were things that I was learning in class that my peers knew as undergrads, and I have never heard of them. But I just had that. That just meant that I had to study more, you know. And I and I tried and I tried to do my best, and, and that's how you advance. And can you talk a little bit more about your experience um, as, as a graduate student? We have a question about how you managed your time as a student. Yeah, I mean, I'm a bad person to ask that question because I really, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a real lab rat, you know? I, I like to wake up early and be at work early, you know? Uh, and I like to stay late, you know? And sometimes, I mean, yeah, I'm a bad person. I, I didn't manage my time. Uh, one thing though, okay, one thing, maybe one good thing about managing time. 
writing is, is hard. You know, you can do all these experiments, but then you have to write the papers and write your thesis, right? You have to write your thesis. And it's hard because you can be sitting there, you don't feel inspired, and sometimes you sit on front of your computer all day, you write one paragraph, maybe. So what I would do is two things. One, have assigned hours for writing. So I will wake up, uh, make some coffee or go to a coffee shop. And as long as I'm drinking that coffee, I'm writing, I'm working on my thesis or on the paper that I'm working in. Once that is over, one, two hours there, that's it. I put it away. Sometimes at night too, I buy the two buck chuck, you know, a bottle of wine. I say, you know, I, I gotta get through this writing. So I'm gonna write and tomorrow I'll check to see how much of it makes sense. And you know, it, it forced me to write, you know, so part of it. So those are two things. Make times for writing where you're in a place where you can just, when you turn off your email and just write, right? The other one was, I learned this from a peer in grad school. He would do the experiment, take the picture of the jail or the photo of the in situ or whatever image. And he'll start making the figure, you know? And I'm like, it's a little early, man. You still have like 10 experiments to go. And, and he's like, no, I'm making the figure. If I repeat it, it's good to go. And then I can focus on the next thing. And I don't have to go back and check what I did or what was that. It's already gone. And actually, when I start doing that, I make a figure, it's like my happy place. I'm like, man, something is being materialized, you know? You and, and you know, the cool thing about making figures, you can put your favorite uh, music or podcast or whatever, and you're making your figure. So, yeah, learn how to use Illustrator and, and make your own figures. Because uh, that way, you know, it, it kind of, it's like, oh yeah, I accomplished this thing, moving on. That's good advice. I waited until the end to do all that, and that's not fun. Yeah. So, yes, I, yes, if I could do that differently, I would, I would definitely do that. Um, so can you just, we're at almost out of time, but I, I do want to get to some questions on um, why you chose your field uh, in, in terms of stem cells and genetics. So we had a lot of questions about that and how you got interested in it. So do you want to talk a little bit about your research um, interests? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh... You know, I don't know if I chose it or he chose me, you know, in a, in a way, like I, I landed on it. Uh, when I went to grad school, I, I went in thinking I was gonna do microbial genetics. You know, I was in, I had that interest from undergrad about how genes were regulated, right? And my preparation was promoters. Promoters turn on different gene, transcription of different genes in different cells. I went to grad school, and I hear this guy, Mark Wickens, who ended up being my, my PhD advisor, talk about the RNA that uh, sits in the egg, you know, like humans, in, in humans, eggs begin to develop in the, in the fields when you, you know, when you are inside your mom's belly and they get made and they get, and, and they sit there when you're born, they are there and they don't do much until you're at, you know, you reach puberty and you start ovulating once a month. That's the same cell. And it has RNAs that are made or are not translating to protein until it is time to ovulate or until that egg gets fertilized. I didn't know any of that stuff in grad school, but it sounded interesting. And I'm like, wow, there's a different level. And my mentor, was a really nice guy and, and very successful, you know? So I wanted to be with a good mentor. I wanted to work for a nice guy, uh, a nice advisor. And I was willing to learn, you know? I, I came in on the prepare, but then I started reading and I started learning. So then my field of interest became RNA regulation, maternal RNA regulation, you know, in the egg and right after fertilization. And then when I was in grad school, my PhD advisor would always say, if you go to a meeting, to a conference, don't just focus on your field of study, 
go to at least one session that's something different. And when we're reading papers in journal club, every once in a while, he will throw in something that's a little bit far away. So one of those, those days, he, he, we discussed a paper about planarian flatworms, which are these invertebrate animals uh, that I study now that can regenerate. You can cut them into little pieces and they regenerate. And turns out that they can regenerate because about 20% of their cells are stem cells, are pluripotent stem cells that can become anything that is missing, the neurons, the skin, the muscles. However, unlike you know, what is known of, of, of induced pluripotent stem cells, human stem cells made in vitro, the regulation didn't seem to be so much dependent or uh, so heavily regulated at the level of transcription factors, it was regulated at the level of RNAs and when they make protein. So it was kind of similar to the egg that I was interested in from my, from my PhD study. So I say, I can use these tools, the tools that I learned from studying maternal RNAs in vertebrates to try to figure out how these stem cells are regulated in invertebrates. And then you start asking, uh, you know, how common is this uh, in other organisms and what's ancestral? And that has taken, you know, you make findings and then things look interesting. And sometimes you pursue things that look most interesting. And sometimes your findings take you to places where you just want to complete the finding and publish something, right? Uh, so that's kind of the trajectory. And I'm, and I'm you know, I, I've studied things that are not so, I never thought I'd be so interested in because sometimes you do experiments and you find new things and you want to keep on learning about that. So don't be so hard set on, I want to study this because even if you are, you might end up spending a lot of your time working on something else because it looks interesting or it looks like you can make a lot of progress in that. And at the end, I go co keep going back you still need to stay productive and get those papers, right? So, yeah, that 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 is, I think the reason that a lot of us are in this field and and are doing research is because we're curious, and sometimes those questions take us in different directions, and um, and allow us to endeavor upon paths that we didn't think we would endeavor upon. Um, so we are almost at time and I do want to end with this question because I feel like it is fitting and um, I don't think we've touched on this, but how did the Leadership Alliance assist you in realizing that you wanted to go to graduate school or how did it kind of open doors for you uh, in terms of, of pursuing a PhD? I mean, everything, right? So, so like I said, my, my first summer research project, my, my first research experience was at the City University of New York through this program associated with the Leadership Alliance. And uh, just being there, and then when I was leaving, hearing from my advisor, kind of like, maybe like you did at, at NYU, saying, you know, hit me up in a year when you start looking for grad schools, because we, we want you back. Mm -hmm. I mean, just hearing a mentor, saying that they want you back, uh, you know, you, you always have this doubt on yourself, right? Like, like the imposter syndrome, you're like, okay, I did this, but they really don't want me here. And when you hear, you know, we want you back. Same when I was a postdoc and I heard, uh, you know, I, I, I worked for one week in a lab and they're like, if you ever want a job, let us know. It gives you that security that you do belong. So, so that was just providing me that, experience and also you know the, the programs that continue of mentorship and knowing not knowing other peers uh that that have the same kind of philosophies as you do in many ways uh and that constant constant mentorship right you you can keep on getting mentored uh when you apply when i was applying for grad school i could ask uh my mentor from the summer program you know they told me this is what you should include Write your letter, reread it, reread it as for feedback. Uh, they help me with letters of recommendation, all that. So, so you know, very direct ways by which they help me get to graduate school. And at the end, you know, it sucks because I really I didn't go back to City University of New York. 
they opened all these doors for me and they say, come back here. And I ended up going to something that I thought it was a better opportunity. And they were completely supportive with, of that. You know, they understand that you have one life and, and, and you, you have to make the decision of where you're going and what, what risk you want to take. So, so don't feel, you know, yeah, you own OM, but also mean you have to come back to the same place. If you, if you, if you go with what, you, with, what you, with what your heart tells you to do. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think we will end it there. Um, so Samantha Anderson will be sharing your contact information, um, but we do wanna thank you, Dr. Rowana, for your time, for sharing your experience with us. And if there are other questions that we didn't get to for those students that are out there, again, we will be sharing uh, contact information. You are free to, to reach out to Dr. Luana as you, as you need to. Um, so thank you all for joining us. This was a great conversation. Um, I know there were a lot of questions on funding and how to finance your graduate school education. We will be doing a whole uh, workshop series on that. So you'll get a lot of good information on, on funding your education. So thank you so much. And we will talk to you all soon and see you on Wednesday for Wednesday's workshop. Thank you so much. Thank you.